Oh, I'm still pretty not good happy with, with this. I'm still not happy with the share screen that I did before. But oh, I know because it's not Google Docs. Okay. So I'm happy with it. I really need to get te more tech savvy. How long are you thinking of going with this? Um, I'm going to just tell you that we are now live on okay. YouTube. So just so I'm happy with it. Um, be aware. No secrets. We're not going to share any <laughs> secrets. <laughs> How long are you thinking of going with this? Um, um, well, I'm yeah, just generally, tell you that we are now live on YouTube, okay. so just so I hear us. Be aware. No, see, do you also hear it? <laughs> How long are you thinking of with the delay? With this? Um, um, yeah, generally the defending democracies have run about an hour, but. I know you've you've given your presentation. Um, I've I've seen you present in the past, so you know we we've got longer on our Zoom. If, if you need, okay. um, we'd love to have time at the end if people have follow up questions. Um, and um, people are in general knowledgeable, not knowledgeable about. I, I just I I wonder if my presentation, as you know, has been pretty long. I tried to shorten it, but I'm worried about talking about things that people already know. I think there's a mix of levels of, of experience with this. Um, so so um, I think you might be able to move a little quickly with the basics, but, but maybe still cover them, like the basic structure of what it is. Um, and if people are unclear, then we can, we can help with, at the end. And I'll invite people to put questions in the, in the chat as well. And I can help stream and feed those to you as needed. Sussex just moved to a line, right? They don't have no line anymore. Or was it not Sussex? Who was it? It just changed. I'm not sure about that one. I'm not sure about that one. Um, well, Morris, Morris definitely the GOP didn't have a line there and they changed to have a line. So maybe Sussex still doesn't. They want so we've, to. we've got 34 people here. So shall we open the gates? <laughs> I'm going to let, um, I'll let people in if nobody's opposed. Go and, for yeah. it. So it's not that a bit. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Leslie. Uh, should I mute my mic? Yes, if everyone who's not presenting would, would uh, mute your microphones, that would be super. We're going to give it another minute or so so that more people can, can arrive. But thanks to everyone for being here. So everyone, if you're not presenting, do me a favor and uh, shush. Everyone, if you're not a presenter, please hit mute on your on your settings. I believe as the host, you can mute everybody. Yeah, can can you unmute? When you're yeah, ready? I'm unmuted. Okay, great, great. All right, uh, I've got. I'm going to let our last 
two people in and then we can start. Well, welcome everybody to our, our next Defending Democracy presentation. Uh, everything you ever wanted to know about county committees, but were afraid to ask. Um, now this program is brought to you by NJ11 for Change. We work towards government that's transparent, accountable, and responsive. And to do that, we urge elected officials to support good policy. Uh, we support candidates who support our values and we, we conduct voter outreach and we run educational programs like this one tonight. Um, if you share these goals, uh, I hope that you'll support our mission by visiting www.nj11.org slash donate. Okay. Here we go. Um, you know, right now we're looking at, at uh, launching our 2021 programs. Uh, and that means some big expenses, especially the VAN 2021 subscription that gives us the information we need so that we can postcard and text bank and phone bank and reach the voters that will help us achieve our aims. So monthly donations or one-time gifts are, are really much appreciated. Now, speaking of transparency and accountability and, and responsiveness, we're here tonight to talk about county committees, which are not always known for being any of these things. Um, you know, even though they show up on your ballot, they aren't governing bodies, they're political bodies, um, committees of our political parties. And as such, they have a lot of power. Um, it starts big at national party committees and it comes down small to the, the state, uh, New Jersey State Democratic Party, which our former executive director, Siley Avalenda is now the executive director of for New Jersey, um, down to county level and municipal level. Um, to think about how small they are on a municipal level, I got involved um, and I won my election with one vote not by one vote, with one vote. I wrote myself in on a blank, on a blank spot on, when I stood in a, in a polling booth and that was it. Um, so so it's, there are ways of getting involved that are really kind of micro and it's a great way to get started. Um, now, nobody knows more about how, um, how county committees work than our friends at the Good Government Coalition of New Jersey which is a statewide organization focused on making changes that will make our government more representative of the will of the people, not political machines, uh, in the interest of, of building a thriving democracy. Um, we're very fortunate tonight to have the president of the Good Government Coalition here, Yael Niv. Yael, Yael is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Princeton. And in her spare time, she puts her understanding of how people think into into understanding politics and explaining it to the rest of us. Now, if you have questions over the course of, of uh, her presentation, please put them in the chat and I'll sort through them and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to address them. Uh, but now please join me in welcoming Yael here tonight. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. And Okay, you see the slides? Oh, you know, I did the wrong thing because I did not share with uh, Optimize for video. So let me just do it. Oh, I did. There you go. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me. I was so excited when you um, reached out to organize this. Every year we've been doing these county committee trainings and you know, with COVID and everything going on, we were a little bit late to start. So you jump-started the whole, this is our first training this year. And it's so much nicer that we don't have to drive far and you don't have to drive far. We can do it via Zoom. Um, so I am going to, there are four parts, well, five parts, for today. I'm going to start relatively briefly with what is broken in New Jersey. Um, many of you already know things that are broken in New Jersey. That's why you're part of NJ 11th for change. Change is because there are things that are broken and we need to fix them. And really our mission at Good Government Coalition of New Jersey is really so aligned with NJ 11th that um, uh, really Leslie's uh, introduction, I thought you, you could have been just reading our mission statement and it would, it would be very similar. 
Um, and then I'm going to talk briefly again about why county committee is the thing that will fix these broken parts in New Jersey, or one very important lever to fix New Jersey. Then I'll talk practically about how to run for county committee. Some of you are thinking of running. Some of you might decide based on today to run. Some of you are already county committee members and are a little bit puzzled about the process. Um, once you're a committee member, because there's not a lot of transparency in that too. So I will cover some of that. And um, I'll end with what to do once you're elected to bring this fix uh, to broken New Jersey. And um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. I also got some questions that you submitted in advance and I'll try to address them as we go. But if I forget um, one of them, then, then please ask it again. Okay, so let's start with um, what is broken in New Jersey. And one very big thing that is broken in New Jersey is our ballots. Uh, literally the piece of paper or the machine that uh, you vote on for primary elections. And I wanna start with a quick video that, that tells this story. Have you ever thought, why bother voting in New Jersey? You've seen the people in charge and for the most part, they don't look like you, think like you, or seem to care about your values. Actually, they don't represent you. You've gone to demonstrations and heard some impressive people who had great new ideas, but they never seem to get elected. It seems that the same people win every year. There's a reason for this. In New Jersey, it's all about the primary election ballots. This is the county line. Party leaders place their favored candidates in the line, hoping you will vote for them blindly. They try to hide the independent voices where you won't see them. A candidate's position on the ballot, not their platform, determines whether they will win. This is not a level playing field. It's a stacked deck. And New Jersey is the only state that does this. In all other states, ballots are organized by the position candidates are running for. It is clear who is running for what position, thus allowing voters to choose whomever best represents them. Only in New Jersey, you have ballots where the competitors to this guy, the county clerk who gets to draw the ballot, are way over here. And there are two of them in one column, confusing voters who invalidate their ballot by voting for both. The end result? Stagnation. No congressional incumbent on the ballot's county line lost a primary election in New Jersey over the last 50 years. Meanwhile, nationally, eight congressional incumbents lost a primary election this year alone. And no state legislative incumbent on the ballot's county line lost a primary election in New Jersey since 2009. While nationally, 154 state legislative incumbents lost a primary election in 2020. This is not what democracy looks like. We deserve better ballots. Join the Good Government Coalition of New Jersey's Better Ballots New Jersey campaign and help bring democracy to New Jersey. Go to www.betterballotsnj.org for more information. Okay, oops. So um, I'll get I'll get to that campaign a little bit later. I'll get back to it. So here's so here's a ballot, a primary election ballot from 2017, uh, when uh, our current governor Phil Murphy was elected um, for his first um, for the first time. And you can see here, for instance, so you can see the county line um, down here. This was from um, Middlesex County. The county line can be a column, it can be a row. So in different counties, it's different. Uh, in Middlesex, it is um, a, a column. And you can see that there are all kinds of other candidates in other places. In fact, there were six candidates. This is the, uh, on the left is the Democratic Party primary and on the right is the Republican primary. So what I'm talking about here is not a partisan issue. Both parties do the same. Here's the county line for the Republican Party and the county line for the Democratic Party. And when you go to vote in a primary election, you're voting within one party. So all the candidates that you're selecting from are all in the same party. You can't vote both in the Democratic and in the Republican um, primary. You vote uh, in the party that you are registered in. And the primary elections are the ones that happen in June or 
you know, because of COVID, they were uh, postponed to July last year. Uh, and um, the candidates that win in the primary election uh, then are up for um, for election in the general election in November. Now in New Jersey, because we have uh, gerrymandered districts, a lot of the races are not competitive. So some places are more Republican, some places are more Democratic, but basically that means that whoever wins the primary election is a shoe in on the general election. So the real election, the real contest for new voices, for new ideas, the real place where you can unseat someone who's not representing you and put someone else instead is the primary election. And many people in New Jersey don't know that. They don't vote in the primary election or they don't think it matters. It is the one that matters. And I just wanted to point out that not only uh, do we have this column and then some people off the column, but all kinds of shenanigans and how ballots are um, put together. So for instance, in the Democratic race, there were six candidates for governor. And you see that um, John Wisniewski, for some reason, is in a different row than um, all the others. And he's not like first in that row. He's in column D for some reason, just seems very arbitrary. Um, but basically tries to take votes away from him to make him look like he's not part of the race and more to others. And the same in the um, Republican race, three are together as if they're running as a slate, which of course they're not because there's only one governor. If someone votes for all three of them, their vote is invalidated. So, and that's not the end of the ballot. This is just the top. If you go all the way to the bottom, you can see, you know, some people here at the very uh edge of the ballot. So this is Laura Zerflu. She is a um, board member of Good Government Coalition of New Jersey, and she ran for county committee. So this bottom position is county committee woman. She ran for county committee off the line, as you can see here um, at the very corner. She did win. She actually got, she tied with Phyllis Johnson, who's the wife of the mayor of her town. Uh, and um, they decided to toss a coin and she won by the coin toss. Uh, she, she won the next election as well, uh, again, off the line. They didn't put her on the line, even though she is an incumbent. So the line is not incumbents. It's who the party wants to see, who the party wants to win. And the reason is they, they do that because they know it makes a huge difference. So all over New Jersey in 2017, in the Democratic primary, Phil Murphy won every single county except one county, Salem County. Salem County is an outlier. It has a ballot that looks like this, that looks like every other state, which is what's called a, um, uh, oh, I'm now forgetting, uh, not position block, roll block, something. Basically it's blocked by the role, the position that people are running for. So here are all the candidates for governor. Here are all the candidates for assembly. There's no column. It's, it's organized in a very clear way. And here Wisniewski happened to be first. So whoever is first also gets an advantage. And there's a whole issue about how to determine the order in the ballot. But this is a much clearer ballot, much less confusing for people. And in this county, Wisniewski actually won. No other county. So what this creates is a situation where progressives or people who are outsiders, who are not part of the party machine, who are not have not been politicians for 30 years, but uh, like maybe many of you who just came in thinking, wait, things look broken. I want to change something. I have good ideas. I want to run. I want to run even for a very small position, even for county committee, um, feel squeezed out of the race because they're literally squeezed to some corner on the ballot. And this has huge consequences. So I'm showing you here um, uh, uh, um, an article about Tansy Youngblood who ran as a candidate, as a progressive woman of color running uh, for um, to be a house representative in CD2 and congressional district two in New Jersey. She was squeezed out by the party who put Jeff Van Drew on the line instead. And despite a really active campaign and a lot of followers, she lost to Jeff Van Drew, who less than a year into his um, tenure as House Representative for the Democratic Party in New Jersey, switched sides and uh, pledged his undying support for Trump. So we can't really say the party is selecting the best people 
to put them on the line. And this is, you know, a good cue that we should just follow as voters. The party is selecting people in all kinds of ways, not even people who will, you know, in this case, who will even stay in the party when selected. And here's another example uh, closer to you uh, in Hudson County. Um, a couple of months ago, the freeholders, now called uh, county commission commissioners, who manage a huge budget and also a lot of decision making at the county level, renewed the ICE contract, uh, um, the prison ICE contract, after they had promised two years ago to not renew it when it comes up for renewal. This renewal is a 10 year renewal. There were over nine hours or actually closer to 12 hours of public opposition. The meeting went after midnight. Every single person, nearly 200 speakers, every single person spoke against renewing the contract and they just happily renewed the contract. So you ask yourself, you know, how can that be? It's the opposite of accountability. It's the opposite of um, these elected representatives caring about what we as voters uh, think. And the issue is they know that they don't really need us as voters. They just need to be on the line and they will win. And indeed, one of the county uh, commissioners had voted against and had been thrown off the line and, um, and it's not, he's not running again because he's off the line. So often people who do not, candidates who do not win the line don't even run. So we have a choice between one person and one person. Most of your ballot is not even competitive. You may as well not go and vote because there's only one person running for each position. So the problem is that we as voters are being manipulated and we don't have to vote only on the line. We can vote anywhere we want to on the ballot, but people are really confused because the general election ballot and the general election, one line, one column is one party and another column and it's another party. And often people do vote down their, their party line because they support the party. And so people think that in the primary election, if they don't vote down column A, they are not supporting their party. Sometimes they are even told that. I know that some of you wrote in questions, the county committee sometimes tells county committee people that they can only support people on the line, otherwise they are working against the party. That is just not true. All of the people on the ballot are the same party. If a poll worker, we've heard of poll workers telling people that they're not allowed to vote on more than one column, that is, I mean, I, it's just wrong. Uh, I was gonna say something more uh, extreme about, a more extreme word, but I know that we're live streaming online. Um, people can vote in whatever column they want and they can vote in more than one column. So being on the line basically means, first of all, that voters will, if they, they will tend to select you because uh, they're conditioned to that from the general elections. Moreover, you have name recognition because at the top of the ticket, the presidential candidate or the Senate candidate is someone that everybody knows. So it seems like you are tied to this person, to Biden or to Trump in the um, uh, recent elections. And you have a much more credibility due, uh, due to that. Seems like a more valid candidate vetted by some higher authority. Um, and the party also, whoever they choose to endorse, so this line is the endorsed line, they give a lot of money to. So this is a really huge advantage for, for anybody who is running. And as I said, people think of party unity. Like if I vote down the line, I'm really supporting my party more than if I vote for other candidates. But as we saw with Jeff Van Drew, that is not necessarily correct because he might go to another party. So th that party line is really what um, advertising companies would call uh, a product placement. So it's really placing the candidates in the place where, as you saw from the little video before, if they're running at the state level or at the legislative level, they will, uh, sorry, at the, if they're running for, for House, um, for, for Congress or at the legislative level inside uh, New Jersey, they basically always win 50 years. Uh, nobody has lost on the line. So this does not seem like a democratic system. Basically, the, the key is to get on the line and then you're elected no matter what voters think. 
And this is done on purpose in New Jersey. It's not only is the line designed on purpose the way it is, and, and I'll get to this in, in a couple of minutes, uh, why they designed it this, who designs it, uh, but also it's really obscure how to get endorsement, how to get on the line. Let's say you're running for some position and you want a chance to get the endorsement and to get on the line. That is different from uh, town to town, from county to county. Um, the rules are really unclear. Nobody is going to try to unpack them for you. They are purposefully unclear because that really um, benefits insiders. If you're an insider, you'll know the rules. They will tell you everything. If you're an outsider, forget it. They will try to hide it from you so that you miss the deadline. You don't send your, your information in on time and um, there's no chance that you will get the line. This is really difficult when you're running for Congress uh, because some of the congressional districts span many counties. Each county has its own date and rules and when you have to be in a specific place at a specific time in order to be uh, eligible for the draw uh, to get a good column. Like if you're not on the line, are you in column D or are you in column F? There's also some uh, Baroque process for that. And this even affects presidential primaries. So uh, someone who's running for president it, across the country needs to think about how do I get on the line in Hudson County versus in Essex County and be and, and have representatives and delegates at the right place at the right time and run with other people. It's, it's really amazing that New Jersey uh, puts those hoops in front of people. So it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, we have a campaign today. I'm not gonna talk about it almost at all. I'm just gonna say we have a campaign at Good Government Coalition of New Jersey called Better Ballots New Jersey. NJ 11 for Change joined this campaign as one of the first groups to join. They sponsored the, um, you all sponsored our kickoff and then uh, signed our resolution. And so if you're infuriated about this, I uh, encourage you to join our campaign. Uh, you can go to uh, betterballotsnj.org and find all the information. And the way to join is basically we have a resolution calling for better ballots and we're getting as many organizations as possible to sign that or that resolution so joining apart from donating which we would also really appreciate is to become a, is by becoming a campaign ambassador and starting to talk to people about this and getting them to sign uh, and people could be your municipal committee it could be your uh township committee, so your mayor and council it could be your church uh, uh your faith group of any kind any group in the state can sign um, the resolution. So that's one thing that you can do that's kind of like a specific thing about the ballot, but what you could do even more is run for county committee, which is why we're here today. So before I tell you why county committee can fix this, I just wanna say that um, this, the line, is really going to be a really hard thing to fix in New Jersey. Nobody will willingly give their power away and most sitting legislators got to where they are by using this mechanism. And they're way more afraid of crossing the power brokers than they are afraid of crossing us voters because they don't need voters because they have the line, but they need the power brokers to have the line. So that is where why running for county committee is so important because county committees are the only ones who can really make this mechanism go away, not by legislation, not by our legislators voting to change our ballots, which is, um, as I said, a very hard climb. So county committee has enormous power. Serving on county committee on the one hand is a very small job in the sense that you don't have to do a lot. You don't have to show up every day. This is this is not something that will be a full-time job and that you have to uh, quit your current job to do, but you can really take an active role and be an agent of change in your community uh, through this. And I wrote here in response to one of your questions, don't let anybody tell you that's not what you were elected for when you go into county committee. So they want, like at every level of government in New Jersey, they want you to come and just say, what do I need to do? say yes and do it, but you can actually affect change. And I've, I'm on county committee. I was elected um, in the last election for the first time. And I've been already told, 
your job is to read emails. And I was like, no, I'm sorry. The voters that voted for me, that's not the job they wanted for me. I told them from the start what I would do. And you don't get to tell me what my job is. They can vote me out if they want to. So don't forget that it's an elected position. Your voters get to, uh, your constituents get to tell you what to do, not the power brokers. So the most important, the reason I'm saying county committee is extremely important with respect to the line is that the, one of the roles of county committee is to screen and choose candidates. So to decide who gets endorsed. So each political party has its own county committee. Each political party has also its own primary ballot with its own party line. And the process for choosing who gets the line in each party is up to, it's, it's a county committee uh, process. It changes from place to place. Um, and I'll, I'll give you more detail about this, but I, I wanna say kind of upfront, the line might be the bane of your existence on county committee because they might make you run off the line and you're gonna to wanna to get rid of the line. So, and which is all the more reason to get rid of the line if you're running off the line. But as Leslie said, you can run successfully for county committee off the line. The higher the position, the, the harder it is to win off the line, but in, in county committee positions, we can definitely win off the line because uh, as Leslie said, one vote is sometimes enough, 10 votes are enough, it, these are votes from your neighbors. So you can go and talk to them and say, see me here and like column G on the corner, that's where you vote for me. So how do counties select who gets the line? As I said, it differs from place to place. In some counties, the chair decides, the county chair. So we have 21 counties in New Jersey, 21 county chairs. Uh, some of them decide single-handedly who gets the line. And when I say, the chair decides, here are some pictures of chairs. So you can see how representative they are of, um, of our state. Uh, a lot of white men. Some counties have conventions. Uh, convention is all county committee members in one place or on one Zoom voting, sometimes with a voice vote. And they have people there noting exactly who's voting against their favorite candidates. They are the chairs and they will then throw you off the line and try to get you unelected. Very few counties, very few, actually a minority have an actual secret ballot where you vote, nobody knows what you voted for and it, it's an actual democratic process. So the first thing that you wanna do if you're on county committee is try to make sure that your county has proper uh, conventions and voting by secret ballot. That's not necessarily easy, but that's the first step. Basically the line is a form of voter suppression and it goes all the way up deciding who's on the line uh, through only some power brokers and not all of us voting, all of us who were elected to county committee voting is voter suppression because voters know that their vote doesn't matter. And so they don't even show up to vote. And you can read this, uh, this quote, it's, it's just so awful. Elections are not won by a majority of the people that I will, um, <laughs> I'm not gonna read it for you. So what else do county committee members do? Uh, county committees uh, decide who gets funding. The political party raises millions of dollars in PACs and super PACs, uh, and they have control over how much money is spent and on what candidates it is spent. Um, candidates who spend more money typically win elections. So as a county committee member, you not only decide who's endorsed, but you can also uh, help make the decisions about how much money is spent on which candidates, how fairly, et cetera. Now, I have to say, in most cases, they're not gonna ask you, even at the municipal level, at the municipal committee, um, in my town, which is considered very progressive, um, I, I live in Princeton, uh, our, our municipal chair said, so this is the money that we have, and we're gonna spend it on this and this election. And someone asked, uh, who decides that? And she just kind of looked puzzled and said, um, normally I do. Uh, so this is a committee of, you know, our neighbors, 20 people, and the chair uh, didn't think that it made any sense to ask people 
uh, to ask elected people who they think we should be supporting. So the county party chair is extremely powerful. They decide on funding. Their signature is required on all transactions in many cases. The party chairs are voted on in a secret ballot by the whole committee. So another really important role that you have as a county committee member is to vote for the party chair that you think will um, run a really democratic process. So actually it's not always by secret ballot, it's sometimes by secret ballot. Hopefully in your county, I know that you're in different from different counties here, so I didn't, uh, I didn't go look at the bylaws for each county. Hopefully in your counties, it's by secret ballot. I know how low a bar that is. Um, deciding who to put in charge is obviously extremely important because it really determines the direction of the party, not only uh, who gets the, well, who gets the money determines the direction of the party. And as a bonus, county committees also fill vacancies when those arise. And you might think, well, when does a vacancy arise? That's, that's not a very common thing, but it turns out that it is very common. So if a state legislator or a county commissioner, I should change this, steps down during a specific window of the year, then the decision of who replaces them doesn't go to constituents, it doesn't go to special election, it's made by the county committee in their legislative district or county. So this is something that legislators use on purpose. They, instead of, well, they don't run to lose, of course. So if they decide that they're not going to run, they're not going to run in the next uh, election, but then they decide in this specific time window so that they could be replaced by someone that the county committee anoints. And um, that means that on the in the next election, the the person who was now who now replaced them becomes has the incumbent title, uh, and they're much more likely to um, to be endorsed, and they're much more likely to win. One third of our legislature was originally put in office through this process, and this goes um, kind of like a kind of ladder. So someone will step down from being an assembly a state. Um, Senator, so someone from the assembly will be put in their seat, and then someone from the and then the assembly seat will be filled with a county commissioner, and then the county commissioner seat will be filled by someone else. So everybody gets appointed. Uh, they get they they again don't need the voters to climb up the ladder. They need to be appointed to climb up the ladder, and then they stay there. And the party gets a lot of people that owe them a lot because every person climbed up the ladder through the power of. The county chair, for instance, who helped them um, do this. So those are the forms of power that county committee has. The original role of county committee was really boots on the ground. So think days before the internet and before texting. Uh, this was really uh, the local people, the neighborhood um, reach of the party. So. Um, every local, um, every district, every polling location had its committee people for each of the parties, usually two people. It, uh, historically, it was a man and a woman. Now it doesn't have to be a man and a woman anymore. And those people would basically know what's happening in the neighborhood and bring that up to the party to, to say, you know, these are the issues that we care about. This is what voters think. So as a co county committee member, your other role is really that, which is to uh, get out the vote, to canvass before elections, uh, to give your neighbors all the information that they need, including information that they're allowed to vote off the line, et cetera, um, to canvass before the general elections, to get out the vote for your specific party, uh, to sit in polling locations and oversee the elections themselves to be what's called a challenger uh, at the poll. Um, and this is the question that, that I saw from someone who uh, wrote it in advance. Am I only allowed to support candidates on the line? And that is, again, a, a lie that, party, um, that the party establishment will tell you. You're supporting the party and all the candidates on the primary ballot are running for the same party. So when you're canvassing, you're getting people out to vote. You're not, you're not I, I believe in many places, especially if you're using 
information that the party gave you, like the, the voter lists, you can't support a specific candidate, but you can, in a true democracy, give people all the information they need, like the fact that this is a very important election because a primary election is really important in New Jersey, like the fact that they can vote anywhere on the ballot and here are websites where you can go and find information about candidates. For instance, the League of Women Voters has a great website with information and vote for whoever you want and don't be blinded by the structure. Don't be blinded by the line. Um, vote for those who represent you best. And of course you can, um, you can canvas and, and run a campaign for yourself no matter where you are on the line or off the line, which is another example of how we can definitely um, support candidates off the line. Okay, so if you're convinced, um, how do you do this? How do you get on county committee? So I'm gonna tell you some of the basics, though exceptions really love to exist in New Jersey, so different places uh, run things differently in order to um, confuse you. So first of all, what exactly exactly is county committee? So Leslie started by saying this is a party structure. This is a, a private, a parties are not considered uh, public organizations, even though they have a lot of power. So uh, um, by law, county committees kind of fall in the gray area where it's not like completely a private company that can do whatever it wants, but it's not, um, but it's not a public organization. So uh, the, the rules are very strange. But in general, it's a governing structure that is internal to, to one specific party. So in New Jersey, we have a Democratic County Committee and, and a Republican County Committee. And the county committee is organized as a set of municipal committees. So each county has municipalities in it. When you're elected to county committee, you're actually elected to both at the same time, to the municipal committee and the county committee. Uh, but there are no separate elections for municipal committees. And you have different roles on each of them. So a lot of what I said now about the get out the vote, et cetera, that you'll do in your municipal committee. And the stuff that I said in the beginning, voting for chair, voting for endorsements at the state level and at the county level, that you'll do as a county committee member. There's another set of groups that are local party clubs, like the Democratic Club or the Republican Club of your town or of your area. And those are not elected positions. Those are separate. They don't decide endorsements. They don't come to county committee uh, conventions. And there's a lot of confusion between these. Anybody can, can join a party club. Anybody can come to their, most, mostly their meetings are open to anybody. Whereas county committee is an elected position. Anybody can run, but not everybody gets elected. So I've already said this, so I'll, I'll go through it quickly. Your role in the county committee usually involves casting a vote, endorsing primary candidates, hopefully. Hopefully your county chair is not doing that solo, or your uh, sometimes some county chairs, uh, instead of having a, a everybody vote, they have only the municipal chairs vote. Um, so that's, that's exactly the point. And, um, you're voting for endorsing the primary candidates, but you also vote for your municipal chair and for your county chair. So if they are the ones uh, casting a vote to endorse primary candidates, then indirectly you are endorsing through choosing your municipal chair and your county chair. Some county committees meet very rarely. So some of you wrote in questions, you've been elected or you're not even sure if you're elected because your county committee doesn't do anything and never communicates with you. So county committees must, at minimum have to meet once after every primary election in which that county committee was elected. So county committee um, uh, positions are usually two year positions, although in some counties now they've changed it to three year positions and four year positions there is a, a trend of deciding that it's really hard to have elections and costs a lot of money. So let's just do this every four years instead of every two years, which is ridiculous because we have elections anyway, even if we don't um, elect county committee members in that same election. But anyway, um, only in right after the primary election in which the county committee was elected, the county committee has to meet as a county. And that's called the reorganization meeting. And um, 
you elect the county chair in that meeting. But if your county committee is a kind that meets only once, it, once in you know, two years, three years, or four years, depending on how often you get elected or reelected, and that does not seem to you like the way a democracy should work, then you can change the bylaws. Every county committee has bylaws. Those bylaws are public and you can try to get people together to make a motion to change the bylaws. It's not easy. None of what I'm saying is easy in a because it's all done by, uh, by design uh, the way it is right now. But in the end, we elect the, count the, um, the county chair so we can elect a chair that will be open to changing the bylaws. So that's at the county level. At the municipal committee, as I said, your elected position also place, places you on your municipal or township committee, where your role there is really to recruit, encourage, educate, promote candidates for your township government. Uh, so to get good people to run and explain the issues to them, and then get people to vote for those great candidates. So get out the vote uh, work right before the election, uh, and challenge, being challengers of the polls and being boots on the ground for the party. Municipal committees also have fundraisers, so you can participate and, and organize fundraisers to raise money for the, par for the candidates, uh, for your local candidates, and uh, decide who contributes, to, uh, which campaigns to contribute to. And of course, you elect your municipal chair as well, which is also an important vote. I know it's gonna come up in some other slide, but I wanna say it at this point, the municipal chair and the county chair are elected only by the county committee. They are not on a ballot. They are not elected by voters. They're elected by county committee members. They don't have to be, even be on county committee themselves. So many municipal chairs are not an elected county committee member. They were never on a ballot. They were elected by the municipal committee and the same for county committee. Any person who is in the party can run for chair. So you can decide that instead of running for county committee, for municipal committee, you're going to run for as a municipal chair directly. And if you get enough support in your uh, municipal committee, you can be their chair uh, without being elected, without being elected on, on the ballot. All the details of what I'm talking about here of how county committee is run are in a title is, are in a law called Title 19 in New Jersey. You can find it online. Um, it details what county committees need to do. It, for instance, that they have to have this reorg meeting uh, right after the election. So here, the annual meeting of each municipal committee should be held on the first Monday following the primary election for the general election at an hour and place to be designated, blah, blah, blah. Now note here, this is from Title 19. It says that they should have the annual meeting, annual meaning each year. Many county committees don't have a meeting each year. They have them only when the chair is up for re-election, which means they're already breaking the law. Like from the very start, they don't meet enough times. Um, says here how they elect the municip the, uh, the chairman and um, how they fill vacancies. The, the law is not very detailed. It's not a long uh, bill. You can read it and see that um, there's not a lot said there. And apart from this, counties get a free hand in how they want to run things. How do they run things? They run things according to their bylaws. So every county has its own bylaws. That is in Title 19 that they have to have bylaws and they have to have them um, uh, posted on the county uh, committee website if there is a county committee website. So you can easily Google whatever county you're living in, you know, Essex County, Hudson County committee bylaws, and you'll find the county bylaws. We found, I think, all 21 of them online. So they are all there. Municipal committees also might have bylaws, should have bylaws. If your municipal committee doesn't have bylaws, you can draft bylaws and suggest uh, a vote on them because then they are binding. And they can de detail things like if the county committee, if the municipal chair steps down, is there an election of the new chair or is the vice chair automatically made the new chair, et cetera. All these different um, uh, 
the the rules that will govern how your small committee will work. To run for county committee, all you have to do is be an adult, so be 18 years old or younger, or, or older, sorry. I, I, I saw this, it, it confused me. You don't have to be exactly 18 years old. I am not. Uh, and you have to be a registered member of the party that you are running in and a resident in the district that you're running to represent. So you're representing a specific district. So in some counties, that district is the whole municipality, the whole town. So they, they're called at-large candidates. So let's say um, Collingswood in South Jersey. So this is mostly in South Jersey. I think maybe only in South Jersey and Camden. Uh, Collingswood has 18 uh, uh, county committee members because they have nine voting districts, but all 18 run as one slate. So there, if you're running in one of these places, you can't just run on your own. You have to bring a slate of as many people as you need in order to appear on the ballot as a whole group. But in most counties, that is not the case. In most places, uh, every polling district, so every literal place where people are going to vote has two representatives. Uh, these used to be a man and a woman. Now that there was, uh, um, there was a lawsuit and a ruling that they do not have to be a man and a woman. They could be a man and a man. They could be a woman and a woman. They can be a transgender person. They could be uh, any, any gender uh, um, or, or that, that people want to uh, define themselves as. So you want to run. So the first step is to find out what district, what polling district you live in and um, whether and, and when is your next election. So only five counties. So I'm going to tell you all of this and then going to say that all of this has recently changed. But it used to be that it was a two year term everywhere and five counties uh, had elections in odd years like this year, 2021, and the rest were in even years. And um, this has changed recently because uh, under the guise of COVID, many counties have changed, have postponed their elections. So Atlantic County last year postponed to this year. Middlesex County uh, was supposed to have an election this year, but last year already, just in case, they postponed their election by two whole years. So now they have four year terms and they made this permanent. And just recently, uh, Union County did the same thing, uh, extended the, the term of the current people in office, which is extremely undemocratic, to a four-year term, uh, postponing their elections from this year to um, 2023. So find out if there are elections in your county. Might be very rare, maybe only well, there are a few counties. So Camden, Sussex, and Warren for sure, but I think there are a few more that have elections this year. And you can call your town clerk or your uh, municipal committee chairman or chairwoman to find that out. Anyway, you wanna call your town clerk because you want to know whether the seat that you are running for is filled or empty. So many seats in county committee are empty. It might be that in your polling district, in your neighborhood, there's only one person on county committee instead of two or zero people on county committee. Whether the seat is empty or filled, you should ask for a nominating petition, which is a petition where you have to get um, signatures uh, from voters on that petition in order to run. This sounds um, scary, but actually you need very few signatures. Most, um, almost all uh, locations need 10 signatures or fewer. Sometimes you only need one or two. It's 5% of the number of voters in the last election. Uh, and your county clerk, your town clerk will tell you that, will tell you how many signatures you need. You should get double the signatures um, just in case. The signatures can be from any voter who is um, registered with your party. So if you're running for Republican party, then you're getting uh, um, signatures from people registered with the Republican party. If you're running from Democratic party, you're getting signatures from people registered for the Democratic party. And they have to live in your polling district as well, in, in the district that you're running to represent. So that means you just go talk to a few of your neighbors and, um, get their signature. You can also get a list of who's registered, but I think at this point they might not give you that list. So you just uh, go ask some friends and many of them 
uh, turn out to be registered. Um, one thing that I wanted to say is now due to COVID, there uh, are changes. Last year, uh, the signatures could be obtained online. Um, I don't know what will what ha is happening this year if they've still if they still uh, kept the online petitions or not. Um, so you should find out again from the town clerk. Previously, you also had the had to have the petition notarized. Again, last year that was waived because of COVID nineteen. If you uh, need to notarize this year, uh, make sure you do that and then submit to the town clerk. Notarizing is also not that hard. Many places uh, have notary publics that will uh, do it for a small fee or uh, for free. Um, the, the municipal committee often has relationships with a notary public who will just notarize everybody's petitions. So you can um, ask the municipal chair uh, how to get your petition notarized and they will help you. Okay, so there are two situations. Either the seat that you're running for is vacant or it's full. So you ask your municipal chair, uh, your municipal clerk or your municipal chair whether the seat is full or empty. I'll start with what happens if it's uh, filled and then talk about what happens if it's empty. Uh, if it's filled, then basically you are going to challenge the person who is now a county committee member. Now you might be surprised, but many people are just county committee members because someone asked them, can you please do this? They are not very involved. They only come to that one meeting every three years, if at all, because they don't have to. And they really don't do much. Um, so they would be happy to step down if you, if you ask them to. So first approach the person who's currently uh, the committee person and say, I'm really interested in local government and I'm, I'm, I want to run. Are you planning to run uh, in the next election? And they might say, you know what? Thanks for letting me know. I'm going to step off, step out of this. Um, you should also speak with them, uh, with the uh, chairperson, with a, a municipal chair to let them know that you're uh, interested uh, so they don't feel blindsided that there's suddenly a competition within the town. My chair told me, we don't like, um, we don't like conflict. So we don't like anybody to run against a sitting member, which made me think you're forgetting what elections are about, but it is, it is what it is. Uh, I would say don't run if there's a sitting person who wants to run, you can definitely run and, uh, and you can win. But many seats are vacant. So if the seat is vacant, then, um, one important thing, and this is especially if you don't have elections this year or, you know, in the next three years because your county committee just postponed, just uh, extended their tenure by, by two years, uh, you still can get seated on county committee without an election if there's a vacancy. So Title 19 says that if there's a vacancy, the committee uh, can, and someone wants to fill that vacancy, the committee can appoint them. Um, with a, with a regular vote with a quorum of the members. So when I wanted to run for county committee, my uh, uh, municipal um, chair immediately said, oh, that's great. We are going to already appoint you now. I told her in January, she said, Let's, let me appoint you now so that in March you can already vote for the endorsements for the primary election. So although I was only on the ballot for the first time in June, I already was a municipal committee member from February and was able to vote on endorsements. And she did that. She actually asked us to fill all the empty seats before the endorsement. So you can also find out what other seats are empty and get your friends to come with you and um, all get appointed. And of course you can get appointed two or three years before the election uh, at any point. If there's no vacancy, you can't get appointed for sure, but you can start building your case to win next time. So make yourself a good candidate, volunteer, get to know everybody, uh, let them know you're really committed to the party and, and that you're really interested in this role. Of course, if you're challenging somebody or challenging a current committee person, you need to run a campaign. This is not a statewide campaign or even a townwide campaign. This is literally your neighborhood. You can get a walking list of the registered voters in your district. You'll get that before 
the election. Um, you can, if they're nice and there's somebody to talk to, you can you can try to get it in electronic format uh, as an Excel spreadsheet so you can organize it in ways that will save you time. Um, you can request them to be sorted by who voted in the last primary election. And you can get a map of your district that shows what streets are in your polling district. And then you need to uh, do the canvassing. So uh, it's not a, it's not a lot of canvassing, and you know, ten votes are sometimes all you need. But you never know, and especially if you're running against somebody, you want to uh, you want to do the work of going to talk to your neighbors, maybe two hours every Sunday. Um, social distancing and masks, do it in a safe way, um, but uh, use your walking list and talk to your neighbors, introduce yourself, tell them why you're running, explain what your role will be. Most of them, they've been voting blindly for whoever is running, they have no idea what that role is. So this is a good chance also to already educate voters, explain to them the importance of primary um, elections, et cetera. Um, ask about their concerns. Obviously, don't promise to fix things because as a county committee member, your power is limited. You can't, you know, if they don't like the fact that there is no uh, stop sign at the end of the street, that will not be part of your, uh, part of something that you can do. But you can, um, as someone who's involved, you can then talk to the mayor, talk to the council, uh, help your neighbors talk to the mayor and council and realize that everybody is very accessible in a small town and maybe you can help them affect the change that they want, but don't promise that in advance. And obviously like in any canvassing, don't leave anything in anybody's mailbox. A week before the election, as always, and again, this might change but if we have an all vote by mail election, you'll have to do it earlier. Um, you can revisit each door that you had knocked on before and really ask them, can I count on your support? It's really embarrassing. I felt really bad doing that. I don't know why I really feel like, you know, asking for support for myself. Um, but that's what you need to do. Um, and especially take the copy of the sample ballot that you got that's similar to the ballots that they got in your polling district and show them where you appear and talk to them again about how they don't have to vote on the line, especially if you're off the line and, and extend that to the rest of the ballot saying, you know, all of these people are equally valid and equally in the same party. So if once you're elected, your rights as a committee person um, are determined uh, by Title 19. So you have a right to view municipal party financial records, uh, bylaws of the county and of the municipal committee, if those exist, um, within 48 hours of being elected. So they have to make those available to you within 48 hours of being elected. Um, you have the right to propose and vote on changes to the bylaws or the county, uh, the party constitution. Um, you have a right to propose and review candidates who will run on the party's ticket, and you have a right to vote for candidates to fill vacancies in elected offices. So that's a lot of power. Um, these constitutions, these bylaws, many people don't look at them. They don't see how full of holes they are, how they don't define things on purpose so that the chair can do whatever they want. Um, but if you think that the process for making decisions in your county committee is not democratic, then you should make a motion to vote for changes of the bylaws, rally people, talk to them, talk to them behind the scenes, get support and, and create a more democratic process. And I think Part of this is, again, it's a nonpartisan issue and it's not I'm against this candidate, I'm for this candidate. This is, we are all for democracy because we want New Jersey to be a democracy. So, whether you're on county committee or not, one really important thing that you can do is raise awareness to the issue of the line in New Jersey. I can say that as a, as a university professor who studies decision-making, it kind of drives me mad how something like 
a lot of like the organization of the ballot is so manipulative and really controls voters to such an extent they don't have to be blinded by the line. So we have this campaign, don't be blinded by the line, where before the election, we send out these different memes. They're supposed to be funny, but also catchy to tell people they can vote for whoever they want. So talk to your neighbors. You'd be surprised people who um, talk to family members, people who have only voted in New Jersey their whole life have no idea how bizarre this is and have no idea that they don't have to vote down the line. And I'm telling you, people who are very savvy, I have a friend who is uh, who was a county committee member and then elected for council and still didn't know about the line, even though she had been elected herself multiple times. So raise awareness, work to get rid of the line altogether in your municipal committee. So in Princeton Township, in my town, we don't have, we don't put anybody off the line. Even though there's a line on the ballot, if we have eight candidates for two positions, for two council positions, we'll put all of them on the line. We had to fight for this at the county level, but we won that fight. And since then, it's been that way. So we don't have, I mean, we have a line, but because everybody is on the line, it's effectively not having a line. And we can try to change that in the whole, count, in the whole county and in the whole state um, in different ways. So talk to fellow county committee members about how bad the line is, show them alternate ballots, show them ballots from anywhere else in the country to show them how this is like really easy, ADA compliant, et cetera, and our ballot is such a mess. Um, vote out chairs who won't give power to voters, support candidates for county clerk. It's a county clerk who actually, which is an elected position, county clerks are the ones who actually draw the ballots. So you can support, there are county clerks who run on a platform of, I will get rid of the line, support them, get your neighbors to support them. And as I mentioned in the beginning, you can join the Better Ballots New Jersey campaign uh, to get uh, your own municipal committee to adopt the resolution to create a better ballot, which is the resolution just says, we support this. It doesn't mean that they themselves tomorrow need to change their ballot because they don't have, the, the municipal committee doesn't have that power. But the more municipal committees in a county that sign this resolution, the stronger our power when we go to the county chair and say, look, half of your county wants to change this. How about bringing this up for a vote in the county, um, the, at, at the county level? And maybe we can get that changed county by county. It's only 21 counties, so it's doable. Um, don't know if I want to go through this because we're almost done. I want to answer your questions. Um, so yeah, so let's just um, finish here. I want to say if you want to uh, continue being in touch with the Good Government Coalition of New Jersey. So we our main focus is on accountability, transparency, and having a government that is as run as, as democratically as possible in the sense that power goes to voters and not to uh, party machines, not to a few power brokers, not to county chairs, uh, and even not to the governor. So the governor in New Jersey is the strongest governor in the country because of how, um, because of the powers that, that laws that the New Jersey constitution gives him. And we would like that weakened as well, because uh, power should be with voters and, and with the, uh, with, um, the different parts of government and not all hoarded by very few people. So to join us in this fight, one thing that you can do is follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, you can go to www.ggcnj.org, our website, and browse the information there. Before elections, we have candidate databases there with information about candidates. Uh, we endorse. Um, we have information about how, what are different positions, how to run for those positions. Uh, a lot of information on that website. Uh, there is a form there to join our call to action list. I can say that we do not use that list a lot. We're not going to spam you every week. Now call for this, now call for that. But once in a while, there's a good government bill up for uh, voting or there's a county committee that wants to postpone their elections by 15 years because they've decided that elections are bothersome. And then we will use our call to action list and say, call your county chair or call your legislator. Uh, and, and here is the script. Um, if you're running for county committee, uh, 
if you're already on county committee, if you're thinking about running for county committee and you liked what I was talking about and think that this is, you know, this is something that you would like to support and you'd like to talk to like-minded people who are on a county committee or thinking about running for county committee, we have a Facebook group called New Jersey Progressive County Committee Caucus uh, or PCCC or PTRIP for short. It is a secret Facebook group, so you can't just join it, but um, you can email me uh, at um, contact at ggcnj.org or you can email Leslie or Mara or Stacy, and we will put you on that group. Um, and if you, uh, NJ 11th are already part of the Good Government Coalition of New Jersey, I believe. I'm not sure it's only that I'm thinking about it we, uh, because apart from signing our resolution, we are a coalition of groups. So if you're in a group, running a group, uh, uh, consider joining the coalition. It's, uh, we, the, the, the fees are $0. Uh, it's <laughs> basically um, uh, getting on our website uh, as one of the, as one of the coalition members and, and being on our, um, on our mailing list when things happen. That's it. I am happy to answer questions. I see that there are lots and lots of questions uh, in the chat. So maybe I will stop sharing so I can see you all. Uh, yeah, I've been I've been jotting down some questions. Um, some of the questions have been answered within the chat by by other participants who who are familiar with them. But um, but I'd like to run through the the list of questions that that didn't have answers right off the bat. Absolutely. Um, since we were just talking about how to run, um, we're hearing a lot of differences from members about what's necessary for a petition. Um, you know, we've, we've got people who, who have been told that they need 10 signatures. We have people from another county who've been told they need 10% of the voting, of the, of the number of people that are within their district at their polling place. Is that completely variable by county or if you're in a county that it's consistent throughout the state? As far as I know, it's 5% of the people who voted in the last election from your polling location. So not all the people who live there, it's those who are registered and voted. So 5% of that and your municipal chair, your not municipal chair, your municipal clerk, it's their job to tell you the specific number, you don't have to calculate it. They, they need to tell you, you need eight signatures, you need 16 signatures, you need three. And I said 16, but it almost never happens that you need more than 10. So the answer should be coming from your municipal clerk, the government employee, the municipal clerk, not the, the chair of the municipal committee. So yes, if the exactly. chair of the municipal party committee is giving you an answer, that sounds fishy. You should go to your municipal clerk who will yes. give you a firm number for you don't have to do the math it's a number yes and the municipal clerk might sound a little bit i don't know again when i called my municipal clerk i thought they would say fantastic you want to run and participate in the democratic process welcome but instead they were like mm -hmm. um why don't you ask the county clerk and i was like well i called the county clerk and they told me to call the municipal clerk okay you need you know six, uh, I can't remember, I needed, I needed eight, I think. You need eight signatures. And I thought, wow, that was a, a warm welcome. But then without me even asking, I got the petition in the mail with all kinds of information. So this person might sound really grumpy, but will actually do their job. They are paid to do that job. Okay, we have, we have one member who, who was told by their municipal clerk in Union City um, that it's 10% of the registered voters in the last general election where the legislature was elected. Not for county committee as far as I know. Um, that might be for running for, legisl uh, for a legislative position. Um, so for different, for different positions, there are different minimums, of course. Mm -hmm. Could it be 10% of the people in your... Uh, you know, in, in the, in the district that you represent? As far as I know, it's 5%. Um, yeah. 5% of the people who, who voted last time. 
at last election, actually, last year. So I don't know if last time is last year or last time a county committee was elected. If they're taking last year, actually, we had higher voting rates last year than um, than years before. So the numbers might be a little bit up now. If someone if someone is getting an answer that doesn't oh that was changed recently to ten percent, um, maybe. Um, hmm. What I would say is don't fight with them over this. Get as many signatures as they tell you to get. Um, you can't, and, and it has happened that people have taken them to court over this because uh, in many places, well, many places in South Jersey in particular, they will do anything to get you to not be on the ballot, even at the lowest level. So they will invalidate your signatures. They'll say that, you know, you sent it five minutes after the deadline, all kinds of things like that. And they have been taken to court. And um, but then by the time you win that, it's too late and all kinds of stuff. So they, they will try in some places In some places they'll be nice and friendly. In some places they will try to stop you. Don't fight them over this get the number of signatures, get more than they said, so that if they invalidate some of them, you still have enough. Um, ballot access, so getting on the ballot in New Jersey is such an unreasonably tough climb that really shows us that this is not democracy. Right, so if, if someone has um, is, is getting conflicting information, um, there isn't some higher authority to appeal to other than taking them to court? Um, I don't know. I, I, the truth is I, I, don't, I, I don't know the answer to this. You can go to the county clerk and see what the county clerk says. Um, you can read the, the bylaws. I mean, th these things will be written somewhere. They're not made up. Uh, you can read Title 19. You can say to them, I just read Title 19 and it says blah, blah, blah. Um, being knowledgeable about stuff is really important here because they will try to just bullshit you. Um, what's the easiest way to get a list of other county committee members in your in your district or in your in your county? Um, those lists are not always public, but there is an excellent website uh, that I can also write here in the chat, Blue Compass. Um, uh, I'm writing it incorrectly. I believe it's .org. Um, and there, um, this is a, um, a website run by uh, Gio Se, who is um, really into scraping all this information and making it available. Let me just check that that's the right. It's not the most, yes, it is the, the right address. It's not the most, you know, flashy user friendly site. He's into data, not into like a uh, 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 graphical user experience uh, on the website, but you can go there to um, Democratic Party information on top. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't have GOP here. It's all the Democratic Party here. Uh, that's why it's blue compass. And go to county committees and search with you're, you'll see all the people in the county committee. You can, uh, what year is the next election, I think. Uh, you can search by your specific town. Um, so, and he's updating this information all the time. So that's a, a really good place to start. He also has uh, emails for county committee members. So um, by law now, a, a bill that League of Women Voters and Good Government Coalition of New Jersey and other good government groups pushed uh, was a bill that uh, required that anybody who's running for elected office provide an email, not only a home address because you're not gonna start sending postcards to everybody. Um, so the emails are public as well. Thank you. So that, that made me wonder um, you know, as, a, as a county committee person who's gonna need to start collecting signatures, um, when I get a list of of vote Democratic voters in, in my district, is that just gonna give addresses or is it likely that that will also have the other voter information like phone numbers or other contact information if I'm not comfortable doing door-to-door -door canvassing? 
Yeah, they have phone numbers. Um, they don't have emails. So this is from the, um, the voter registration, voter registry. And uh, so when people register to vote, they this is the information that they give. So phone numbers and um, addresses. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of those phone numbers these days are are um, textable, but it won't tell you whether this is a, a landline or not. Um, I can say that there are fairly cheap ways to do a texting campaign. So, you know, for, if you have the list, and especially if you have it in an Excel spreadsheet for like $25, you can text all of them. Some of them won't be, uh, cell phones, but you can text all of them. Um, uh, Herb Terboos has a company that it, then he's, he's a progressive, guy, he really wants to help um, people who are progressives who are running for office. So he can, you know, give you a, a cheap deal. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to get my whole municipal committee to use texting because calling, I, 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 I did some phone calls. Um, I didn't get very far. It just takes a really long time. Most people are not at home. Lots of numbers are wrong. You can send texts to all of them in half an hour. And now some will reply back and some won't. Um, you can phone, you, you can uh, you can do some phone calls if you want to as well, but texting is really, really easy. And, and I think the, the party should try to adopt it as much as possible. Yeah. I think a lot of a lot of uh, New Jersey 11 people have experience in texting or in other in other contexts and know how how easy it is to to do though. Um, you know, so not not, not all people there. read these texts, but I think they are less invasive than phone calls. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you write, you know, hi, this is Leslie, I'm your neighbor. I like when I call people, I would say this is your L, your neighbor from Franklin Avenue. Like, you know, this is not a this is not a robo call. This is like literally me yeah. um, because I don't know most people in my neighborhood, but they, the people were pretty nice. Yeah. And I think your, your point about this being people in your neighborhood is really interesting because it's the people who vote at exactly the same desk where you vote when you when you show up. So it really is a small community. Um, One of my favorite jobs as a member of the county committee is being a poll challenger and getting to kind of lurk behind the the poll workers and keep an an ear on things and make sure that things are going the way they're they're supposed to go. Um, But it also, you know, a nice thing is that I recognize half the people who come in to vote (laughs) and, and, and you know, it's, it's neighbors. So those are the people that I'll be talking to, to sign a petition or to ask them if they'll vote for me when I show up on on the ballot. So it really is this very small community-based thing to do with, as far as running for office goes. It's about as, as you know, small and easy as, as it comes. Um, One other thing that you can do to reach more people, again, given that this is very local, if you have a local um, newspaper, like a town newspaper, or sometimes some towns have a blog or a, a uh, something online, you can write a letter to the editor. So I wrote a letter to the, the editor explaining um, why county, uh, uh, saying to people, vote for county committee people, like think about county committee, county committee is really important because they determine the structure of the ballot and like explaining, you know, this is, it's a very short letter to the editor. So I explained as best I could the issues of, uh, of the line in a, in a letter. And also this was last year where we had these very confusing vote by mail election. So I also explained that um, just, you know, our, our role is to get, is to get information to our neighbors. Hi, Justin. I just see Justin there. He's also a um, board member in Good Government Coalition of New Jersey. Mm-hmm. I see a question that people ask, what did I say? What was I talking about with $25 to getting the, the phone numbers? That's not to get the phone numbers. That's if you got the phone numbers from your uh, municipal chair or from your county chair, it's, and then and you can feed them into the texting system. It doesn't cost, it costs, you know, pennies per text. But to get the phone numbers, you're not going to get them from, um, you're not going to get them for $25 but you should be getting them for free basically uh, when you're running for county committee. Uh, Joyce has asked, how can we get access to van if the county committee chair will not grant it? Because that's a much easier way to track and contact your neighbors. Are they under an obligation to, to grant you access to van if you are running? 
I don't think they are. I think if you are already an elected member, then even then they might not be under obligation to you. I mean, they, yeah, unfortunately. But what you can get is a, is a list of the, the registered voters in your party, in your district. Yes. From, yes. from, from the, the municipal clerk. The municipal clerk of yeah, your this, town. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. So another, another question that came up um, was whether county committees are subject to OPRA. Um, I actually don't know the answer to this. Justin, do you know the answer? Uh, my understanding is that organizationally, yes, but individually as members, no, because you're party affiliated, not technically municipally um, elected, but don't quote me on that. Not a lawyer, not a scholar. That's my, that's my understanding. That's, that's a kind of twilight zone where county committees are private organizations that are, they're, you know, they belong to the party. They don't belong to the people in some sense. And, and I wasn't clear about one thing, which is um, when you're running for, well, I may, may have not been clear about many things, but when you're running for county committee, you only run in the primary election. So there is no election of county committee in the general election. That makes sense. Um, Kristen pointed out um, for people who, are, who want to need to get signatures for petition, um, that if all you need to get is you know, 25 signatures, you can actually just plant yourself outside. <laughs> out front somewhere public in your neighborhood. And that can be an easy way of getting signatures very quickly in a, in a couple of nice days um, when, the, when the weather is right. Um, another question that came up um, that I spotted um, is, uh, is if you can give us an update on the status of the lawsuit that's challenging the line. And while you answer that, um, I've gotten the questions that I've spotted. If anyone answered something that didn't get answered either in the chat or, or that I haven't brought up to Yael yet, um, if you can type it again, just so we make sure not to not to mess it. If so regarding the lawsuit, so there is a lawsuit against several county clerks um, uh, claiming that um, that the county line is not con is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. um, that lawsuit is is moving forward. It will take years. This is not a very fast process. It's in the Supreme Court, the New Jersey Supreme Court. And um, I think we're, you know, we'll know in a couple of years what came out of that. Um, so it, it's great that that lawsuit has been, um, has been launched, but uh, it's not gonna help us right now. Um, I, wa I wanna say that this whole fight against the line and changing the party, whether changing both parties, whether from within through county committee, whether from uh, uh, grassroots pressure through uh, the, uh, the Better Ballots New Jersey resolution, whether through a lawsuit, it is all um, a long game. It's not going to change in a day or two, uh, but it, it will basically be the biggest change in the political landscape in New Jersey forever in some sense or in, in you know, I don't know, hundreds of years. So that's why it's so hard and we have to have patience for it, but it'll be really huge when it happens. So it's really great that, that we're coming from all directions, that there is a lawsuit, that, the, that we're trying to change from county committee, from within county committee, that we have the resolution, et cetera, uh, trying to, to hit from all directions. This is really thought provoking because it's, you know, there, there are so many facets to this. There's the, there's the political maneuvering of the county committees, but there's also, Sort of the, the the fundamental work of being a member of a of a political party that is the responsibility of county committee people. Like one of the things that you know, or some of the things that um, that I've been you know responsible for doing as a county committee person. I mentioned being a, a poll challenger, but there's also um, you know canvassing and getting out the vote with the people who live in the you know the blocks that surround you, um, and using your your knowledge, your boots on the ground to get to get the vote out in the general election, as well as in, in, the, in the primary. Um, so that's something that, that can be a really satisfying thing to do, to talk to your own neighbors um, and make sure that they're, that they're getting out to vote. And that's such a nuts and bolts aspect. And, and I wanna say that, you know, all politics are local politics. Mm -hmm. And once you're in county committee and you start 
hearing what's going on and talking to people more and finding out what bothers them, then maybe the next time there is a council seat that's uh, opening in your in your town, you will run for that. You, you, you realize that government at the municipal level is in many cases really, really local. These are the council members and the, and the mayor. So my, my, uh, our mayor just changed in Princeton, but my previous mayor, I had had like Passover at her house multiple times before she became mayor. Uh, the, it's all very, very small, but with a lot of power and a lot of important decisions that the mayor and council um, make. So it could be, even you're not, you know, you're not planning to be a politician, but you're here because you want to change the world, at least a little bit. And when you start that change, you'll see that there are levers, that there are local levers that you can use, that you can um, influence, even if you don't run for council. If you, if you just go to council meetings and, and make statements there, if you sit there, these are meetings that are open to the public that usually have nobody or like, you know, the same four people complaining every time, bring five people from another direction so that they can hear some other voices and suddenly there will be change in your town. And we've done that in my town and part of a group called um, Princeton Progressive Action. And in four years, we're amazed at how much we've managed to do just by a few people, like three or four people showing up to um, council meetings. So I think apart from like the big thing that we want to do, we want to get democracy in New Jersey. We also want to make our towns inclusive and have affordable housing and have, uh, and, uh, and have a better, uh, you know, be greener and, and more environmental friend, environmentally uh, sustainable and, and all these different things that we want to do in our very local government and the county's not going to do that for us and the state's not going to do that for us and definitely Washington DC is not going to do that for us that is totally within our towns and with our neighbors and and this is a really great way to to start affecting change in, in multiple ways thank you very much well we're we're at 8 30 at this point I appreciate everybody sticking around for for learning all this um Hold on, let me see, the, another post came in. Let me make sure it's- Oh, it was just a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, but thank you to everybody for, for coming. Yael, thank you so much for coming and sharing your expertise and your experience with all of this. Um, we will be, uh, we'll be sharing um, links to, to this presentation on YouTube and on Facebook so that, um, so that everyone can see that. Um, I'll also be including um, I'll be including the, um, some of the websites and, and links that, that have appeared in the chat so that people can look for, for more resources. And, um, and Mara and Stacy and I are very happy to, to answer questions or to help people get in touch with Yale after, after the meeting as needed. Um, thank you so much. And thank you so much for what you do. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of NK 11th for Change and, and each of you personally. Oh, well, thank, well, thank it's you. a mutual admiration society for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Elle. This is it's a very hot topic, and I think we're going to have a lot more questions going forward. So we look forward to a relationship, and I hope a lot of people go and join the Good Government Coalition because there's a lot of important work to be done going forward. Yeah. And, and good luck to everybody who decides to run for, for county committee. Um, please, please let us know if we can help you track down information that you need. Um, and we're, we're really happy to be boosters for members who are running for office. It's one of the biggest thrills of being in NJ 11 for change over the past four years is seeing how many people have moved into taking that kind of active role. And, uh, and we want, we want, that's who we want to see right. <laughs> starting to have stronger influences and a bigger voice in the state. Yep. So thank you. Great. Good night, everyone. Thanks night, so much everybody. for coming. Yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.